Right, so ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to our National Security Law Seminar uh, uh, series. Uh, thank you for spending your Saturday morning uh, with us. Um, I'm Fu Hualing, I'm the Dean of uh, Faculty of Law. I'm, I'm very happy to sit here to welcome uh, over 140 some participants from uh, different parts of the world. Um, today we uh, move away from some uh, particular articles of the law or some specific cases of uh, its impact um, to something that has to do with um, the constitutional structure, the framework and the foundation of uh, Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy. Uh, I call it um, the, some big picture uh, issues. So the focus is not the uh, individual decision by the court, but the continuation of judicial independence, not a censorship of a particular story, but the viability of a free press, uh, not the withdrawal of one reading from the syllabus, but the continuation of um, uh, university of autonomy and so on and so forth. Um, so we'll be touching upon different scenarios in the post uh, NSL, Hong Kong, um, the responsibility of the Central People's Government and the SARs in reducing tension, restoring confidence and uh, narrow, narrowing the, the gaps in our political divide. We should be thinking about the implications of the fact that we're almost um, halfway through the 50 years of one country to system design. And also thinking about the next 27 years uh, uh, and um, beyond 2047. So in this seminar, we step back away from some of the immediate concrete concerns and invite our scholars to reflect on some larger structure issues and offer some academic, uh, if I may use the term, uh, ivory tower uh, analysis, which I think is very much needed in this highly pol polarized and politicized um, uh, uh, community. So today we have um, three distinguished speakers uh, who have written extensively on Hong Kong uh, constitutional debate and the Chinese uh, uh, constitutional and political uh, issues. Uh, they are all deeply committed uh, to maintaining the one country to system design. And because of their educational background, work experiences, uh, I think they are best suited to offer uh, um, uh, some very valuable perspectives uh, on what is happening in Hong Kong and what may be coming in Hong Kong in the near future. So the first speaker is uh, Dr. Chen Jie, uh, who is a, a associate professor at uh, um, the UBC School of Law. Um, before that, she was associate professor at Tsinghua University. Um, Dr. Chen Jie is well known for her critical views on judges and the courts, and of course, the judicial independence in Hong Kong, among many other things. Uh, she's a very sharp observer of Hong Kong's constitutional uh, development. Uh, she will talk about the impact of the legislation on the structures of one country to system, and uh, in particular, uh, matters of design, framework, and um, uh, foundations. So uh, without further ado, may I invite uh, Chen Jie to make her 10 minutes speak. Uh, 10 minutes speak. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Fu. And thank you for sending us these big picture questions. Um, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion. These are all very important issues for Hong Kong, and they are also challenging topics for constitutional lawyers. Um, since I'm in Vancouver um, for the past year, all my opinions are based on facts from news reports, 
online discussions or otherwise personal accounts have um, received. So if I make any factual mistakes, please um, don't hesitate to let me know. Um, the national security law is um, considered to be uh, one of the um, probably most influential enactments after uh, 1997. So if we um, want to compare the constitutional um, orders created before and after the national security law, basically we can see that before 2020 or before the enactment, um, Hong Kong has already evolved into kind of a checks and balance structure, even though the central government does not always want to hear uh, separation of powers or these kind of uh, frames. But the, the frames are, you know, it's, it does not really matter what we call it, right? It's just a matter of naming and framing. What matters is what actually, um, you know, what, what the Hong Kong constitutional order actually looks like. So um, basically before 2020, we see that among the three government uh, branches, um, the executive and the legislative have mutual checks and balances, while the judiciary um, in most cases play the role of a adjudicator or even kind of a, it's kind of like the scale. So this almost to create a supremacy of the judiciary. Um, you know, um, Professor Fu said, I'm critical of the judiciary. I'm not really critical about the judiciary. I just uh, wrote about how the judiciary or the, how the judicial power evolved into uh, be more influential or to be more um, powerful and to play kind of the major role in Hong Kong society. So that can be read as critical to the judiciary if you presume that the judicial uh, authority or the judiciary should be um, the supreme uh, authority in Hong Kong. But otherwise, uh, you know, if, if you read the basic law, if you compare Hong Kong before 1997 and uh, after 1997, it's actually very clear that before 1997, um, the court or the courts in Hong Kong are not as powerful as what they look like after 1997. Again, it, it's debatable, right? Some said this is because basic law fundamentally changed the constitutional order in Hong Kong, but others may say that according to the basic law, um, Hong Kong's constitutional order should be roughly about the same, so the judicial power should be roughly about the same, uh, whatever you, we have observed after 1997 is because the judicial power has been growing. So we, which is probably my um, observation as well. But after um, the national security law, um, basically I'd like to say that the NSL um, provided some uh, provisions that I'd like to consider as in intrusive provisions. And, and the result is to kind of have some um, effects on the government structure, which will say, we'll, we'll see that, for example, because of the creation of the National Security Advisor, um, the central government now have has a kind of director um, inside the, the, the Hong Kong government, as well as, um, you know, um, other uh, more direct um, um, management or more direct administration of the um, special administrative region. Um, if, I'm, if I'm able to show you the picture, I think it'll you know, probably um, even uh, even more obvious uh, how different the two pictures are. So in the past, um, the central government 
uh, is still powerful, right? It has, for, for example, it can return the legislation, it can um, have orders uh, to the chief executive, it can appoint all the major government officials. Um, but we see the government, the, the central government's um, office in Hong Kong, the liaison office, is almost a parallel. It's the paralleling office in Hong Kong. There's no direct connection between the central government and Hong Kong's government. But with the advisor, which is um, the director or the minister of liaison's office, it creates a very interesting um, connection between the central government and Hong Kong. Um, I think in, in China, you know, advisor can be a tutor, right? Or it can be a kind of a council, right? Whatever um, the, you, you want it to be, or there's a, a lot of space to um, develop or to, 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 uh, to, to grow. Um, and what will happen to uh, Hong Kong after um, this national security law? I, you know, according to my understanding, we will be able to see some, you know, anticipated changes in the future. First of all, uh, because of the creation of National Security Committee, and especially because of the creation of the National Security Advisor, it's likely to see the executive branch be further kind of dependent on the central people's government. And second, um, the law may have significant impact on the election of legislative councils, which we, we have already seen that some of the candidates were blocked because of their um, you know, behaviors or activities or because they've been activists in the past. Um, but what's probably most uh, um, important or at some point you can say it's detrimental um, is the impact on the judicial power. Um, if if we compare the you know the the supreme the the, the court of final appeal um, under Chief Justice Andrew Lee and um, the court of final uh, appeal under Chief Justice Geoffrey Ma, and you, you may already see that the judiciary has been more moderate over time, and we've also seen kind of courts become the court becomes more divided. It used to have a lot of unanimous rulings, but now it has some, it starts to have some divided opinions, which probably reflect Hong Kong's uh, own um, society um, as a kind of a divided society. But still, um, because the national security law provides that um, the court will not be able to interpret the provisions of the national security law. Um, the chief executive can appoint judges who adjudicate these kind of cases. And also the judiciary is not allowed to adjudicate or to have the review of decisions made by the national security committee of the Hong Kong government. And I assume that um, the judiciary will not be allowed to adjudicate whatever the advice is from the advisor so it's very likely that the court's um, authority will be um, greatly um, affected. So we, we, we don't know if um, the, the court will eventually kind of become more um, subjective or um, to be more political, um, but I think it's, it's not uh, difficult to kind of anticipate that the courts will not be as active as before. The, the court will probably be more um, deference, to have more deference to the political authorities of Hong Kong as well as to the um, central government. Um, however, I, I had the view, and I've um, talked about this, that I, I don't think that the national security law is actually about 
national security crisis in Hong Kong because um, you know we, uh, China has military station and China has um, you know direct and indirect uh, administration powers over Hong Kong. Um, my view is actually that the real crisis of um, the previous governing structure is that it failed to respond to the collective identity crisis in Hong Kong. So this collective identity crisis also evolved after 1990s when Hong Kong started to enter into kind of a transitional uh, stage from a colonial rule to a um, relatively representative government, but then at the same time still under you know, um, both the British government and with the anticipation of the Chinese government's rule in the future. So it failed to hold the society together um, as what one country, two system is supposed to um, uh, function. And the, the failure is due to the fact that um, before 1997, there has been kind of a new collective imagination of how, what Hong Kong society should be. And that's, that imagination is based on the liberalism um, understanding of the society. Um, and Beijing, I think Beijing understands the, the crisis. Uh, before um, 2020, there has been quite a few uh, discussions and debates of w what should um, Beijing react if Hong Kong does not pass the national security law, the Article 23 legislation, could the central government make a law, um, either you know, as Appendix 3 or as, as a decision from the National People's Congress Standing Committee? And I believe that the chilling effect caused by the national security law uh, has already been uh, anticipated or expected uh, because that'll function to sort of expel the city-state narrative of the liberals. Um, but there's still a gap between the national building story provided by the Beijing government, which, you know, people in the mainland uh, were pretty much um, familiar with that, and the liberal society story or the narrative of what kind of society Hong Kong is or should be or was. So um, without a new narrative, um, the story or the old story will not be filled, will not be able to fill the gap automatically unless um, Beijing is able to facilitate a real meaning discourse among different sides of Hong Kong um, Hong Kong's um, political um, arena, as well as between Hong Kong and the central government. I think there are, you know, my, my understanding uh, will, you know, um, I, I hope that this understanding will later um, answer some other questions Professor Fu um, brought up um, in his email. Um, but because of the time limit, I'll just uh, stop here. Thank you. Well, th th thank you very much, uh, Jay, for, for this. Uh, um, what I mean to say is a very critical views of the uh, constitutional development in Hong Kong. So the takeaway, as I said, is um, so Hong Kong may have, is going through uh, a, a few stages. The first one is the SAR, SAR government uh, at the controlling point is the uh, only government in, in charge in Hong Kong affairs. So gradually there was the narrative of a parallel uh, system by right? uh, central government playing a more uh, assertive and active role in Hong Kong's governance. That's the second stage. So now after the national security law, we may be moving to a, a singular mode, uh, but then this time uh, with the Central People's Government playing uh, a leading role. And that shift uh, has implications, of course, not only uh, in the narrative of uh, uh, executive-led government, but it also have implications on the, the Legislative Council 
and and the function of the judiciary. So, so basically, still we have uh, uh, two narratives: one in Hong Kong, one uh, for the, uh, the the China, and um, so Hong Kong would have to overcome our sort of identity crisis to move forward. I'm sure there will be uh, uh, opportunities to um, to invite Jia to uh, to uh, um, um, uh, 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 develop the uh, argument. So our uh, second speaker is uh, Professor Yu Xindong. Uh, Professor Yu Xindong is, uh, uh, is the Anthony W. and the Nulu C. Wang Professor in Chinese Law in uh, Canal Law School. Uh, Xindong is a, a thinker, is a, a philosopher, uh, um, one of his uh, jurisprudential interests uh, on Hong Kong is the concept of uh, constitutional commitment, uh, the commitment to one country, to system, uh, and, and because of the commitment or based on the commitment, uh, he's going to explain the imperatives of um, uh, uh, having one country to system continu continued moving to the future. So in the process, he also, uh, uh, touches on, on some of the inherent difficulties in the national uh, security law. Uh, uh, Professor Yu uh, is well known uh, in Hong Kong. He used to teach in um, CUHK's uh, the Department of Public uh, Administration and the Politics. So Xin Zhong, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for organizing this Zoom discussion. I appreciate this opportunity to share my views with our colleagues. I will make several brief remarks. First of all, I would like to re-emphasize the idea of constitutional commitments, as Huadian just pointed out, which I explored in my article formalism and constitutional commitments in Hong Kong's constitutional development, which I wrote in 2005, uh, which Professor Albert Chen kindly commented on and was later collected in a book, Interpreting Hong Kong's Basic Law, The Struggle for Coherence, edited by Professor Fu Huarin and others in 2007. The constitutional commitments made by the central authorities and shared by the Hong Kong government and the people, of which the most important is the principle of one country, two systems, high autonomy, and Hong Kong people running Hong Kong. These are enshrined in the basic law, and constitutional commitments are essential because they serve as foundation for interpretive or doctrinal paradigms and actions. Generally speaking, a commitment represents a determination based on moral judgment. Commitment means understanding, determination, and the sacredness. I want to emphasize that point. Once a person or a competent entity says what he has committed to, it means that there is no doubt that he will fulfill or she will fulfill his or her promise. And it is also uh, observed by standards uh, in the eyes of the, of the bystanders. So commitment to the one country, two systems ideal will celebrate Hong Kong's constitutional identity as well as its future, which is a uh, pragmatic solution to a thorny problem uh, which became political and constitutional ideal held by the mainland and Hong Kong government's leaders. Uh, in the relationship between the mainland and Hong Kong, uh, this constitutional ideal works as a guide to, as well as a constraint, on um, the ultimate criterion for imagining interactive possibilities and institutions. The national secret law has actually recognized the constitutional commitments enshrined in the basic law. Article one of the national secret law says, law is enacted for the purpose of ensuring the resolute, full, 
and the faithful implementation of the policy of one country, two systems. After which, the people of Hong Kong administer Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy. Hong Kong's constitutional future may be better served by understanding and pursuing these commitments. I believe as long as there are deep and genuine commitments by the central authorities and Hong Kong government to the constitutional idea of one country, two systems, Hong Kong's constitutional development can move beyond the current conflicts and confines, despite differences uh, in many respects, including interpretive approaches and different understandings of uh, certain provisions of basic law. Secondly, uh, I think the national security law has reaffirmed the Hong Kong legal system's major principles, the rule of law, the presumption of innocence, and double jeopardy or res judicata, whatever you call it, the lawful procedure, uh, the right to defend oneself, etc. cetera. Uh, these principles of common law have been recognized and upheld uh, by the national security law. For instance, Article 4 recognized the fundamental rights enjoyed by Hong Kong people under the basic law, ICCPR and ICESCR. And Article 5, uh, in fact, states that the principle of the rule of law shall be adhered to in preventing, suppressing, and imposing punishment for offenses endangering national security. And which says a person is presumed innocent until convicted by a judicial body and shall be liable to be tried or punished again for one offense for which they have already been uh, finally convicted or acquitted in judicial proceedings. That means that all these great principles that is practiced in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, have been recognized by this law. Okay. Now, thirdly, uh, the national security law, in my view, actually also constitutes a new interpretation of the basic law. Article two of the national security law states, the provisions of, of article one and 12 of the basic law of the Hong Kong special administrative region or the Hong Kong special administrative region's legal status are the fundamental provisions in the basic law. Now, uh, I want to bring your attention to this, uh, this, this, uh, this concept of uh, fundamental provisions. It is understandable from the perspective of the national security law that these two provisions are the textual foundation for making such a law, emphasizing the bottom lines uh, of the one country element of uh, uh, one country, two systems. Right. Still, the concept of fundamental provisions, uh, is new. This is not a familiar concept in Chinese constitutional jurisprudence, nor Hong Kong's scholarship. Even internationally, there's a little discussion of this concept. In that sense, uh, the national security law could be seen as having offered a new interpretation of the basic law. However, in general, there are other fundamental provisions in a constitution. We all are familiar with what our fundamental rights, right? human rights protection clauses, provisions, those are fundamental laws, fundamental provisions of a constitution or of, a, of the basic law. So how to balance these fundamental principles needs further consideration, needs further elaboration, detailed discussion or detailed explanations and so on. Fourthly, I think the national security law has created a normative space in which certain activities will take place. This space has its internal contents as well as uh, its external relations. Uh, the boundaries of such a space must be clearly delineated. The structure, actors, events, activities, 
and institutions within that space should be readily identifiable and understandable. What is the relationship between this normative space and those created by the basic law and the existing Hong Kong law? It has been assured by mainland officials and also uh, Professor Albert Chen, I guess, that this law will only deal with a very limited number of cases, uh, not affecting the general human rights of the Hong Kong people. However, there is a genuine concern that this law might be used uh, in some way detrimental to the general populace interests and rights. So how this normative space will interact with other normative spaces in Hong Kong is hard to tell, but we can only hope for the best. One of the examples is that this law actually has created a number of institutions, including a committee uh, that, or, or, and the advisor that, that uh, sent from the central government as discussed just now by Dr. Chen Jie. So who is that advice? What kind of role will that advice play? And what kind of qualifications should that person possess? Should that person be a lawyer or be a purely just a, a political appointment? So those questions have to be uh, answered and, and those kind of boundaries uh, have to be delineated. Okay. Uh, this normative space okay, will actually uh, develop uh, gradually on its own and in its interaction with the, the existing spaces, we will see whether it works or not. And that needs a lot of efforts from all of us. And uh, uh, that's one of my major, major, major arguments here, uh, views I want to share with you guys here. Actually, uh, in conclusion, I want to conclude by saying that uh, I have been arguing for the principle of subsidiarity in the central SAR relationship over the years. Uh, in my recent article, Authority and Subsidiarity, Constitutional Experiment Experimentalism in Hong Kong, I argue that a proper balance between authority and subsidiarity should be maintained. If we regard the making of the national secret law as an authoritarian act for the central government to exert its authority, then it is now is the time to focus more on subsidiarity, leaving Hong Kong alone and let Hong Kong people manage Hong Kong for better or worse. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Um, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you have used uh, the term but normative space uh, to offer uh, the inter interfacing between one country uh, and uh, two systems. Um, and uh, you have uh, stated um, firmly that um, we uh, hope for the best. And, um, and um, you also pointed out the decisive rule of the various com committees and uh, officials from central government in shaping the future uh, in in controlling the so sort of the police and the two different uh, normative spaces in Hong Kong and their interactions. So, so they're quite um, uh, interesting and insightful. Um, now let's move to the uh, third speaker, um, uh, our uh, Dr. Yan Xiaojun, who is associate professor uh, um, in the Department of Politics and the Public Administration. Um, Dr. Yan has re written extensively on contemporary, contemporary Chinese politics and also on the um, uh, uh, Hong Kong's um, uh, political uh, adventures, uh, if I may use the term. So Xiaojun, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Fu. And also, um, I uh, thank for the audience and the panel. Uh, I just uh, uh, enjoyed hearing the, um, the panelists speaking about their views on the national security law. Um, because I'm not, in the past, I'm doing research on security state, uh, but uh, in recent years, I changed my, shifted a bit. 
of my research from the security state to the propaganda state. Because for uh, the political scientists, uh, the text of the law is one thing, but also it's equally important to see what is the political discourses uh, evolving around the law. So I think uh, Professor Yu and Dr. Chan just talked uh, extensively on the text of the law. Uh, in, my, uh, in my 10 minutes, probably I will talk more about the political discourses uh, about the law so that we can have a bigger uh, political landscape uh, in mind to better understand the law. Uh, well, uh, during the time of the ena enactment of the national security law in Hong Kong, I noticed there are four, uh, sort of uh, three to four uh, major speeches made by the central officials in terms of the national uh, uh, security law in Hong Kong. Uh, there are uh, three or four things I found that are uh, interesting to, for us to probably to, to, to observe. Uh, the first thing I think in these political discourses about the uh, national security law, uh, the very first topic is what kind of law this is. Uh, from the remarks made by central officials, uh, I observed that uh, from the understanding of the central people's government, uh, the national security law in Hong Kong is a comprehensive law, which means it's not only one kind of law, but it's a com comprehensive and uh, holistic uh, legal codes. Uh, it set out uh, like four kinds of offenses. Uh, secession, subversion, terrorist activities, and the collusion with a foreign uh, country or external elements, uh, which probably refers to Taiwan on the one hand side and uh, NGOs uh, in other foreign countries as well. So this uh, is a kind of criminal codes. It uh, set out uh, the uh, criminal uh, offenses that might be prosecuted under the law. And also, it uh, sort of set, uh, put forward the new institutional arrangements for enforcement of this law, both at the Hong Kong level and also on the, uh, on the central level. Uh, there are uh, clauses about the procedures, so it's also a procedural law. Uh, so overall, and also it has uh, Article 9, 10, for example, about uh, the Hong Kong SAR's uh, duties in terms of the media social organization, universities, schools, and the internet, and so on, about uh, the safeguarding of national security. So this is, uh, I, I think this law has an uh, overall rounded impact, uh, not only uh, in the criminal aspect of uh, the uh, safeguarding national security in Hong Kong, but also probably the everyday life here uh, from school to, uh, to the media. So there are uh, clear uh, boundaries and bottom lines here set out. However, on the other hand side, I also see as Professor Yu just mentioned uh, that uh, there are uh, important uh, principles, legal principles that are shared by both uh, the mainland uh, legal system and Hong Kong legal system. Uh, in the political discourses, I, uh, we observed that there, uh, the central people's government mentioned there are six principles that are shared by this law and Hong Kong's existing legal system. That is uh, the, uh, no penalty without a law, uh, retributive justice, no penalty without pre previous law, uh, procedural justice, presumption of innocence and the right to counsel. So this kind of uh, principles uh, are clearly stated in the law. So I can see from the political discourse that uh, the um, makers of this law are trying uh, their best to like uh, to uh, have uh, uh, a sort of a coordination between two substantially different uh, legal uh, systems, but trying to find uh, some kind of common ground. So uh, this, as Professor uh, Yu Xinzhong said, that this shows uh, some kind of commitment to the basic law and also to the uh, one country, two systems. So we need to see uh, uh, how this uh, commitment uh, works out uh, in the future. Uh, the second point I observed in the political discourses in the national security law in Hong Kong is about the enforcement. We know that uh, the national security law in Hong Kong has long been in planning, at least uh, several years. Uh, so in, uh, in, but also it's, uh, uh, the, the social movement last year 
provided a chance or opportunity or a window of, of opportunity for the enactment of this law. Uh, the very first sign of such a law is in the making, probably is in the communicle of the uh, 19th Central Committee of uh, the fourth plenum meeting of the 19th uh, Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. In the communicle, uh, it says that uh, the Central Committee has resolved that uh, it has uh, to establish uh, or uh, betterment the, uh, uh, the legal system and enforcement mechanism to safeguard national security in Hong Kong and Macau. So here, uh, when I first read that the communicle, I think the most extraordinary thing is about the enforcement mechanism. And uh, because this has never been mentioned in the previous uh, uh, political or policy discourses about Hong Kong. So uh, it turns into reality when the, uh, after the enactment of the national security law that uh, one of the signature feature of this law is uh, the enforcement uh, structure. So uh, as uh, 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 Dr. Chen also mentioned that uh, this is a two level power structure or a two level enforcement structure. Uh, there is a central power or central jurisdiction in terms of safeguarding national law in Hong Kong. And correspondingly, there is a central enforcement agency, uh, the Office of Safeguarding National Security in Hong Kong, which is a, a, which is a central government agency with uh, privileges and immunities, and is beyond the jurisdiction of any uh, executive, judicial, or, uh, or legislative uh, agencies in Hong Kong. Uh, there is a local power uh, structure, of course, and also there's local jurisdiction. Correspondingly, there's a local enforcement uh, agencies that are uh, newly established. But for me, I think the most important thing here institutionally from the uh, per perspective of a political scientist is that uh, these two power structures now has a linking point. The linking point, which means these two levels of power structure meet uh, in the Committee for Safeguarding National Security of Hong Kong. Uh, in this committee, as uh, both uh, of the panelists just mentioned, that there is an advisor uh, in national security, uh, which is a central official, but also a member of the uh, committee, uh, the local committee, for safeguarding national security. So this uh, new uh, uh, post of advisory role actually serves as a linking point that links uh, the central power structure and the local power structure uh, in the institutional design of uh, for safeguarding national security in Hong Kong. So I think this uh, is the uh, one, of, one of the most important feature. And also there's a specific clause here uh, article 55 in terms uh, in this uh, in this article uh, basically uh, there are three uh, situations there are three uh, occasions that uh, the central uh, government agency in Hong Kong can intervene uh, in the investigation and the prosecution and trial of uh, uh, the national security cases I read the three uh, cloud uh, in uh, read this article I think it mentions uh, three occasions. The first occasion refers to case, a specific uh, a group of cases that might be uh, under the jurisdiction of the central government uh, agency. Uh, and the second uh, occasion will be a situation, a serious situation. So situation would be more systematic and more overall situation in Hong Kong that uh, for some reason or for some uh, 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 for some causes that uh, the national security mechanism in Hong Kong may not work uh, under certain situation and the central government agency might take over. Uh, the third clause, I observed that it talks about the threat. So uh, some sort of specific threat might trigger the intervention of the central government, a major and imminent threat to national security. If it's discovered by the uh, central government agency, I think uh, uh, it will uh, probably it will fall under the jurisdiction of the central government agency. So I think it uh, has a, a three specific case uh, occasions. One refers to sp specific cases. Uh, the second one is a specific situation, and the third one is a specific threat. So these three factors, either uh, one of uh, the three factors, might uh, trigger 
a central intervention. So this is a sort of a new creation in this law, but I think it's clearly defined, but we, uh, without the case, we still don't know how this will work out. So I think we still need to wait and see uh, how these three, the case, a specific case, what is the specific situation and what is the specific threat that will trigger a central intervention. The third thing I, I mentioned, uh, I observed in the political discourse uh, in terms of the national security law is uh, a remarks, is uh, one of the paragraph, paragraphs in the remarks made by uh, the deputy vice uh, director of the uh, Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office, Mr. Zhang Xiaoming on July the 1st. Uh, on July the 1st, uh, Mr. Zhang uh, uh, specifically emphasized that uh, the national law in Hong Kong, na national security law in Hong Kong, uh, does not mean that the central government uh, see all the opposition, political opposition, or the pan-democratic camp as the enemy of uh, the central government. I think this is uh, quite an important political discourse that uh, it shows at least two things. One is that uh, the, purpose, the intention of this law might be set up a boundary. So what the central government would uh, tolerate and in, out, out, outside of this boundary, probably the central government would not uh, tolerate uh, politically. So uh, I would see, I, I, I would say from this uh, uh, paragraph uh, of very important political expression that uh, uh, reflected the, the intention, one of the intentions is to set a clear the boundary. The second thing I think the central government might want to use the national security law to differentiate the radical component uh, of the uh, opposition from the more traditional or more uh, institutionalized uh, democratic uh, opposition in Hong Kong. And uh, the, uh, um, probably uh, in a way, the central government also uh, in this discourse, we can see that probably they also want to uh, use the space, the clearer space provided by the national security law to engage in more extensive, probably more intensive, more extensive and more and broader conversation with the uh, uh, pan-democratic camp. So I, I think this is a very important political discourse, but the implications of it or the real meaning of it is still um, not very clear. So we uh, also, we still need to wait and see what this uh, will, uh, will work out. Last but not least, I think uh, in the political discourse, is uh, on September, uh, sorry, on July the 5th, uh, the deputy, another deputy director of the Central uh, uh, Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, uh, Deng Zhonghua, uh, uh, said in a uh, uh, conference that um, because the uh, origin of the national security law in Hong Kong is a resolution made by the National People's Congress, the National People's Congress, uh, in this, uh, sort of remarks, uh, Mr. Deng said that uh, the delegation of power uh, to the Standing Committee of the National uh, People's Congress to make a national security law for Hong Kong, this delegation is not a one-off delegation. So which means uh, the making or drafting or enactment of national sec uh, security laws or measures to safeguard national security law might be a process in which um, or of which the national security, national security law might be only the starting point. So uh, I think this is an interactive process as well. Uh, uh, both sides, the central government and the Hong Kong society are observe each other's action and the intention in this political uh, uh, confrontation or political uh, bargaining process. Uh, but the, how this interaction, how this interactive relationship uh, will play itself out, I think will determine whether uh, this, uh, uh, how long this process will be, uh, how long this legislative process will be, how many laws will be, uh, how many, uh, wh whether there will be additional measures uh, to be enacted. So I think uh, for now, uh, the most important thing for me is that the central and the Hong Kong uh, uh, sides uh, should build up uh, uh, mutual trust in order to have uh, a positive outcome of this uh, probably uh, legislative process.
and also it's a highly charged political process as well. So that's my um, some thoughts on the national security law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so lawyers uh, tend to look at the text and the political scientists uh, look at the context. So thank you for offering this uh, very sophistic sophisticated uh, reading of the uh, extra uh, legal or the legal and extra legal materials and um, uh, especially in uh, understanding the Chinese legislation, uh, the, the, the political and legislative intent is often extremely important to figure out uh, you know, what, what, the, uh, what purpose or agenda uh, the law may be uh, serving. So I think our speakers uh, sort of uh, come to a, a, a agreement on three points. If I might say so, first is there is a commitment to one country to system in the national security law, commit, uh, commitment to rule of law uh, and the protection of human rights, as all the speakers have uh, rightly pointed out. Uh, and the second, um, the national security law also uh, uh, has caused some uh, potential or real changes, especially in the creation of uh, different committees the role of uh, advisors, who is now the, the direct, uh, uh, director of a liaison office. Right? So, so there is a change from probably, if I may, I may use the term indirect rule in the past to direct, uh, uh, direct rule uh, currently. So, so there's uh, more alliances between uh, SAR government and the central government. So there are tensions between the two possible versions uh, uh, as to where Hong Kong may be uh, moving toward. So I, I think all three speakers uh, have agreed that uh, we have to wait and see how things evolve, all right? History is to be written. We are all the authors uh, and very much it depends on uh, what we do. Uh, then uh, we determine the future direction. We talk about mutual trust conversation, right, um, tolerance, understanding. Um, so I finally, um, I should uh, leave, have left that to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Albert Chan, who is the commentator of the session. Uh, Albert doesn't uh, need any introduction. He is the Chinan, uh, 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 Chin Chen Lan Yu, professor in constitutional law uh, and also a member of the Basic Law Committee of the National People's Congress Standing Committee. Over. Thank you, Harling. Um, I'm very good, glad to be able to see uh, so, uh, our old friends, uh, three old friends, uh, and to, um, to hear your views. So what I'll do is to just to comment briefly on some of the points each one of you have uh, raised. Uh, and uh, I hope we will discuss further uh, these points. So Professor Chen Jie raised uh, several points. One is the, um, the role of the judiciary. Uh, you mentioned uh, the increasing uh, role uh, of the judiciary in the post-97 constitutional order. Uh, that's probably because since the basic law came into effect, uh, the judiciary you know, has now um, you know, this new role of uh, acting as the interpreter and guardian of the basic law, a role which it, it, before the handover, uh, the colonial constitution was a rudimentary constitution. And uh, even though there was the Hong Kong Bill of Rights, uh, but it was not as comprehensive as the basic law in terms of um, uh, regulating the, the the whole structure of governance uh, and uh, laying down um, many social policies and, and so on. So I agree with you that uh, the Hong Kong courts, after the handover, uh, have actually um, uh, played a more uh, important role in terms of constitutional interpretation uh, or policy making or. Um, or uh, scrutiny of uh, the administration and of legislation than uh, before 1997. As to whether they will uh, 
become more differential in the future or whether the authority will be affected adversely uh, by the national security law or, or related developments. Um, uh, I think this is um, uh, a, a, a crucial question. It is difficult uh, to predict at this stage. Actually, as I just said, the basic law uh, coming into force enabled the judiciary to play a more active role as interpreter and guardian of the basic law. So maybe the national security law also has the same effect. The coming into effect of national security law also gives the judiciary uh, additional space, additional opportunities, uh, because the, they, they will have to be the interpreter of the of the national security law, in the absence of any interpretation issued by the NPC Standing Committee, the Hong Kong courts will be the interpreter of the national security law uh, in the course of deciding cases. So how are they going to interpret? Um, I think, um, Professor Fu, uh, you, you, you have uh, actually, um, uh, you have gone to the court to, to hear and watch the proceedings in the Tong Ying Kit case. So maybe later on you can share with us your thoughts on how in this first major case uh, on national security law before the court of uh, first instance, the, the Hong Kong court uh, has dealt with um, the national security law and, 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 and interpreted it. Um, another issue raised by uh, Professor Chen Jie is the uh, issue of collective identity. I agree with you that there is a crisis uh, in Hong Kong uh, uh, originating from the, the collective identity of many Hong Kong people, which differs from uh, what uh, the mainland side uh, expect uh, uh, their identity to be. Uh, so, um, and you also, talk, you also talk about the gap between the so-called liberal story and the, and the nation building story. Uh, and that is a, a very uh, uh, big problem uh, in Hong Kong. The uh, patriotic education, um, which was proposed, it, actually it's called, not called patriotic education, it's national education curriculum that was proposed uh, a few years ago, um, was partly designed to deal with this, but as you know, it has been, it was strongly opposed to, and uh, it was shelved. So. So it is difficult to see how this collective identity problem can be solved in the foreseeable future. The national security law can prohibit people from um, advocating secession, but um, it cannot prohibit people from, um, from, uh, from thinking uh, in certain directions. Uh, it cannot um, change people's uh, psychology or sense of collective identity as to who they are, whether they are Hong Kongers or, or Chinese and so on. So uh, I don't think this problem can be resolved uh, in the foreseeable future. And, um, and uh, this may continue to be a source of conflict uh, and tension and instability in Hong Kong in the foreseeable future, particularly in terms of in terms of um, elections, uh, yeah, as you know, the, the, the opposition or the pan Democrats and localists uh, were aiming at gaining a majority of the seats uh, in the legislature. Um, but the election has been postponed, but it will still have to be held uh, probably at this time next year. So we cannot, uh, the government uh, cannot compel people to vote for the, uh, the patriotic camp. So people will still, you know, vote uh, in accordance with their, their, their political preferences as to, um, as to what are the candidates, who are the candidates they would like to support. Uh, if they want to support candidates who are in favor of the Ho Hong Kong identity, there's nothing which the government can do. Some candidates may be DQ, uh, but only on fairly narrow gap ground. So it's not possible to DQ all the all the so-called opposition politicians. So now I move to uh, Professor, sorry, who is, who is the second speaker, Xin Zhong. 
Will you, um, I agree with you that uh, the constitutional commitment to one country, two systems on the part, on the part of Beijing still exists, even though the critics uh, of Beijing uh, after the enactment of national security law said that, well, there's no longer one country, two systems. But, but I don't agree with this view. I think from, from what I know and from my you know, contact with mainland officials and scholars, there is a genuine uh, continuing commitment to one country, two systems. In fact, President Xi Jinping has said many times that he wanted to implement one country, two system, but, but in a correct manner, uh, in an un, undistorted manner. Uh, he doesn't want to have distortions. Uh, um, so he said, bu, bu yang, bu bian xing. So <laughs> one country system should be faithfully implemented uh, in, in a correct manner uh, and not uh, be, be subject to distortions. So uh, on, on this point, I, I, I'm much um, um, impressed by Professor Yu's drawing our attention to the fact that, that, there, that the national security law is actually um, putting forward a, a new interpretation or a new perspective uh, on how to understand the basic law in a sense that Article 2 of the National Security Law says that Article 1 and 12 of the Basic Law are fundamental provisions of the Basic Law. Actually, before you pointed this out, I, I, I'm, I, was, not, uh, I was not very conscious of, uh, of the importance of Article 2. So I think you, you, you did enlighten me in this respect. So um, Article 1 and Article 12 of the Basic as you said, uh, is about one country. So the one country element, one country, two systems, is an important element, uh, foundational element of one country, two systems. So the Chinese government is still committed to one country, two systems, but it doesn't want the one country element to be, um, to be threatened. It doesn't want, want a one country element to be, uh, to be um, put at risk uh, by advocates of Hong Kong independence uh, uh, and so on. So that's why there is this national security law. That's why national security law is set to set the red line or the baseline, the descent of one country, two systems. In particular, the descent of one country as an element of one country, two systems. Now I move to uh, Professor Yan Xiaojun's uh, presentation. I think uh, it's very useful uh, to look at the political discourse. Um, I think many of the critics and opponents of, of uh, the Beijing uh, policy linked in Hong Kong uh, uh, simply disregarded uh, things said by the uh, Chinese officials. Uh, and put forward their own interpretation. They they don't they, they don't even bother to to respond to what Beijing officials have said. Uh, they simply ignore or disregarded what they said. So it is important, I think, to to seriously uh, to study what they said. Um, and any discourse, any dialogue, uh, which uh, as all of you have uh, indicated. Uh, would be useful in promoting mutual understanding and trust. Any such this uh, dialogue must be based on uh, understanding what the other side's position is. So uh, to understand what the other side's position is, uh, we have to study what they say. So uh, I think it's important and, uh, and agree with uh, Xiao Jun that uh, what they say uh, must be taken seriously. I, I also agree uh, with Xiao Jun's analysis of the three types of circumstances in which the central authorities through the National Security Office in Hong Kong will exercise jurisdiction directly over national security cases. So you mentioned that the first uh, situation relates to a particular type of cases in which um, um, you know, uh, there's um, uh, 
there is a conspiracy with uh, foreign forces uh, and so on. The second uh, type of cases relates to a particular situation, uh, which uh, is a serious uh, situation in Hong Kong generally. And the third, you said, uh, is a, a serious threat, uh, uh, which is eminent to national security in China. So I think both the second and the third uh, kind of, case, uh, of uh, cases relate to particular situations. Well, then, rather than the type of cases. So I would say situation uh, actually can be used to describe both the second and the third uh, kind of circumstances in which, uh, in which the central authorities will intervene. And these are both very uh, serious uh, uh, situations. It's not just one case uh, having a particular, uh, particular set of circumstances or characteristics is, is um, for example, in um, the second type of situation, um, according to Article 55, uh, is, uh, you know, this SEL government cannot uh, effectively enforce the national security law. So it, it must not just be one case, okay? If, if this situation arises, the, whole, the capacity of the SAR government uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is a, ha, has been so adversely affected by particular circumstances that it's not able to, to enforce the national security law. And the third kind of situation is um, a grave uh, threat to national security. And, and this doesn't just refer to grave threat to national security in Hong Kong. So maybe there is also a threat uh, in mainland. And some people have given the example of war or, or imminent war between China and a, a, a foreign country which threatens China's national security. So the final point I would like to make is, uh, is, is just to add one more point um, to this discussion. This is the so-called geopolitical dimension. Um, as far as I understand, uh, one main reason, or in fact, probably the main reason for the enactment of national security law uh, was, was that the anti-extradition anti movement had happened. So, but for the anti-extradition movement of last year, I don't think there would have been a national security law. So, and the anti-extradition movement was interpreted by the Chinese side as a kind of color revolution um, with foreign forces, uh, including the, the U.S. Uh, behind, uh, behind it, uh, giving support to, uh, to some of the activists. So given the, the worsening relationship between U.S. and China, uh, I think um, the, uh, the national security law can be interpreted as, as a move on the part of China uh, to defend its national security uh, against uh, threats to China's national security posed by the U.S. and other so-called foreign uh, foreign forces, and they, they, the Chinese government doesn't want Hong Kong to be used as a base for subversion uh, of the of the mainland uh, regime. Uh, this this was made very clear even even in the late 1980s when the base law was drafted. Uh, Deng Xiaoping and others have said very clearly that, that they don't want Hong Kong to be a, a base of subversion against the Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, government or, or the Chinese Communist Party. And that, that's why they had Article 23. And since Hong Kong had not legislated in Article 23, and now there, was, there is this grave threat uh, to China's national security as evidenced by the anti-extradition movement. So we have the national security law. So, I think the future enforcement of the national security law may also depend on the future relationship between the U.S. and, and China. Uh, I think that is, a, in fact, a very worrying development. Um, Sing Zhong, you are in the U.S., maybe you, you can give us more insight uh, on this. So that's all um, for, in terms of my comment. Right. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Albert, for, for this. Uh, 
very uh, uh, nice summary. And um, so, 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 ladies and gentlemen of the audience, if you have any question, so please type it up and send it to the uh, respective speakers. Uh, if you could introduce yourself briefly, uh, they will be better. So um, before we uh, take questions, uh, may I ask the panelists um, whether you have uh, anything to uh, to say to in to, in to to respond to Albert's comments and and, and uh, to engage each other? So I'll give uh, each of you about uh, three five minutes. May I start with uh, uh, Cheng Jie if you have any comments responses and questions um, to the other speakers. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much, Professor Abertin, for your comments and, and thoughts. Um, first of all, in terms of the uh, development of the judiciary in Hong Kong, I have a lot of respect to the Hong Kong judiciary. Um, I, I have to say that again and again, because I, I feel like because of my research, some people thought uh, that I'm against the foreign judges, I'm against the uh, uh, judicial power, or especially ju judicial supremacy in Hong Kong. I, I think I basically observed the development. I observed the courts, um, the, the judicial movement from a more formalistic uh, court to uh, the formalistic judiciary to a more active judiciary. And I have uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, kind of noticed of the political competition between the courts or the judiciary in Hong Kong and then the, um, the, the uh, political uh, assertion from the NPCIC or the, the General Central, Central People's Government. So I, I think I sort of um, predicted in my 2006 article that if there's a real competition between the Hong Kong judiciary and the Chinese political authority, um, the upper hand will always be in the political authority because it runs faster and the, the, the political authority can, you know, can, can, can take the advantage of uh, not being bound by all the procedures um, when the court will have to react more um, passively. So I, I did not mean that um, the courts uh, should be less active, but um, I think my observation may have caused some uh, different interpretation. And also, I I noticed that, uh, for example, Professor Alberton, Professor Sam Yang, and Professor Johannes Chen have all shared the view that the Hong Kong courts uh, from 1990 on, and especially after 1997, uh, has become more internationalized. Like they, they, for example, they refer to more international cases. They use not only uh, British cases, but also German cases, um, you know, EU cases or other international court cases. Um, you know, of course, the, the basic law says that they can refer to other common law jurisdictions, but apparently the EU cases are not, you know, obviously common law jurisdictions. But anyway, I, I think that, that we can see the movements and uh, we, we cannot pretend that there's no such kind of uh, uh, development of power. Um, and also I, I think the national uh, security law clearly discourage judicial activism. Again, I, I, don't, I don't think that's um, necessary, um, but you can read from the provisions that that's the intention um, and these intention has end up, um, you know, res resulted in kind of the all, all kind of institutional blockades for the judiciary to act more actively. And also because of that, I, I believe that the courts, um, even though they will still have space to manage cases, for example, the courts can say we're not interpreting the cl the clauses. We're just uh, applying the clauses. But if you apply the clauses, if you apply the provisions, you always have to have an understanding of the provisions, right? So by that, I think in the future, the Hong Kong judges or the judiciary as a whole will have to be more creative than before. Um, even though they, they have already been very creative, right? Otherwise there won't be judicial um, constitutional review in the first place. 
Um, so that that's my kind of reflection of the first uh, comments from Professor Albert Chen. And the second one is about collective identity issue. Again, I agree with Professor Chen, and I also share the concerns of commitment um, uh, raised by Professor Yu. And I, I know that he, he had written about the commitment um, years ago, and which sort of provide uh, the justification or the, the strong incentives for the central government to keep its commitment. My view is that the liberal narrative has been so pervasive though. Um, so that it, it, it's kind of create the, the, the tension between um, the, the national um, story and the, the, the regional story or, or the liberal story. So one proof is that the most successful social movements um, have been mobilized by middle school students, right? Like Joshua Wong and, and his uh, cohort. So, so that means that it, it's already deep into the minds of the Hong Kong people. And I, I said in another of my articles saying that, you know, th this is almost like saying that Hong Kong is a distinct society, like Quebec is a distinct society of Canada. But if you examine um, the stories before 1990 or especially 1980, no one thinks Hong Kong is a distinct society, right? So the, the story evolved after 1980. Um, and and it, it became uh, a popular story and it provides all the, 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 the reasons and justifications for why Hong Kong needs to be more independent, to have more uh, liberty and freedoms um, and even need to, to consider itself as a city state um, or kind of uh, incentivize some kind of resentment either peaceful or, or violent. Um, so I, I think that's a real challenge. Um, and I, because of that, I also don't think um, it can be easily um, compromised only because there is a commitment because um, people can always have their own interpretation of what the commitment really mean. For example, one country, two systems. Everybody say, oh yeah, I, I support one country, two systems. But you know, there's one view believe that you have to prioritize one country. And then another view think that um, two systems is the precondition for one country. So th there, there's always different views. So for me, the most important commitment is to I use what um, Kassantin said, it should be a, 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 a forum. You know, we, we can disagree with each other, but let, let's agree that we always, we can, we, we should always sit together and let's continue our discourse. Let's continue our um, debates. Let, let's not say that I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to play with you or let's die together. <laughs> so th th that's the um, worst scenario than just let's sit together and start to fight, right? even though neither of them is, is the optimal one. So finally, um, I, uh, I think that the commitment um, or, or, or the, the, the collective identity challenge is not limited to Hong Kong and China, it's a, it's worldwide challenge. Um, as Benedict and Anderson said, you know, it, it's, we now realize that what we had in mind in the past is just an imagined uh, community, right? We, we thought we, we were Yan Huang Zi, so we were the children and grandsons and granddaughters of Yan Huang, but that, that's just story, you know? Um, we, we can make some other stories and people will believe them. And, and then even if we, we use the same language, uh, even if we share the same history, we, we can interpret them differently. Um, and that's um, a real challenge for all of us and not limited to China or Hong Kong. Thank you. Yeah, th th thank you very much. I, I just add something, I think, uh, I think probably the identity crisis is even deeper. I mean, the liberalism itself, I think, is fun. I think it's probably the, there's a particular version of liberalism in Hong Kong. Right? We Hong Kong defines ourselves 
uh, as China's reference. So, so whatever China presents Hong Kong is different. So our, our, we define rule of law uh, against the lack of rule of law in China. We define as our freedom. So, so, so that's a unique defensive negative type of liberalism. Uh, um, it has evolved uh, uh, with China as, as the reference point. So, so thank you for, for, for your comments. Uh, Xin Zhong? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Huadin and uh, Albert. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, my view is very consistent. You know, I am op op optimistic that uh, uh, we have to stick to certain rules, certain principles. Uh, even though uh, this law, of course, uh, is full of conflicts and contradictions, in inconsistencies, and so on. I think we have to emphasize certain aspects that we, you know, we, are, we have to be loyal to our ideals. We, if we believe that, uh, you know, Hong Kong's legal system uh, is, uh, is characterized by its in judicial independence, you know, stick to principles of rule of law and so on. So we must stick to those and we must defend those values. Um, whatever happens, uh, you know, I guess there are different ways of reading this law. One way of reading it is very much like offensive reading. That is, we will just focus on those provisions that uh, are basically not working or basically uh, not very good for uh, individual rights and so on. And another way of reading is, this is that we'll find out those positive sides, positive aspects of the law and try to defend, try to make them, propagate them, let people know that we uh, stick to these ideas and so on and so forth. And uh, on the whole, I guess I share with uh, uh, Dr. Chen's view that uh, the Hong Kong judiciary actually is one of the best in the world. So uh, let's have confidence in uh, the, the judges of Hong Kong uh, judiciary. I think they will be able to distinguish, uh, you know, cases where, I mean, to certain cases in the best interest of Hong Kong people, even under pressure, you know, even, um, under circumstances where you don't have rules, clear rules to rely on. But uh, for constitutional discourse, I guess we need to focus on those aspects uh, where we think that, that uh, we, we can do something uh, positively. Um, like, you know, spill, spill out um, some, or clarifying some of the, uh, of the unclear points and for instance, uh, like the 13, um, Article 13.3 basically says that uh, uh, the uh, decisions made by that uh, commission, committee uh, is not subject to judicial review. Then I guess we have to ask, ask what kind of decisions are those decisions? Are they, you know, sovereign, sovereign acts or state secrets or whatever, you know, uh, um, um, unreviewable, uh, you know, things like that. I guess we have to uh, try to talk more about these difficulties and try to clarify so that uh, uh, we are actually making best of uh, of a not so good piece of legislation. <laughs> I guess I will just stop there. Thank you. Okay. Shall you? Uh, thank you, Professor Wu, and uh, also uh, Professor Chen for making the comments. Um, I just want to uh, respond in one point. I, I agree with uh, Professor Chen's comments. Um, the, the one point I think is important is that the geopolitical factors are really important in terms of uh, the uh, constitutional development in Hong Kong and also political development in Hong Kong. But uh, I want to add one sentence is that a geopolitical factor in, from the perspective of a political scientist and of a former student of international relations, I know that uh, geopolitical factor is always a double-edged sword. So at this moment, it might help, it might seem to be helpful to one party, but uh, probably just uh, after one day, it will be harmful. 
uh, to the same party. So uh, in my view, if uh, in a political, highly charged political field, if uh, we, uh, any party relies too heavily on an external uh, geopolitical factor to fight a uh, political war, it will be very dangerous because uh, geopolitical factors is changing so fast and so unexpectedly. Uh, uh, these kind of things are always in flux. So uh, that's my uh, sort of uh, one addition to the point on geopolitical factor. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you uh, very much. Um, let me just move to some of the questions. Uh, there's actually one question for Xiaojun. I think you mentioned that uh, in your reading of the, um, the political papers, it was um, uh, mentioned that uh, national security law maybe is only the beginning. Uh, uh, it depends on circumstances. There may be other legislation. The question is, so if there is a second sort of uh, legislation after national security law, so would, would that be restricted to the area of national security law? Um, can the standing committee simply just legislate as it prefers, uh, as it says fit? So what is your take on that? Um, thank you, Professor Fu. I, I, uh, from my understanding, from my uh, individual observation of the political discourse made by uh, Mr. Deng Zhonghua, uh, I thought there are several points. The first one is that uh, this uh, national security law, uh, the legislation of it, actually went through a two-step procedure. Uh, the first step is that the National People's Congress uh, made a resolution, uh, which uh, in this resolution, the power of legislation in, in the field of national security in Hong Kong has been delegated uh, to the Standing Committee. So uh, my understanding is that this delegation is not a one-off delegation. So uh, now the standing committee has uh, all, uh, within, all, uh, all within its power to make uh, legislation or legislations uh, that is uh, uh, within the jurisdiction of the resolution uh, uh, passed by the National People's Congress. So, so long, to, to put it simply, if, I, I think so long, the circumstances uh, are uh, uh, requires the uh, standing committee to do that. It ha now it now has the power to legislate in the field of national security uh, for Hong Kong. Uh, and and also the second point is that national security the, the concept now uh, in the mainland China political discourse is a all rounded concept, uh, is an all inclusive concept because uh, most aspects of national life uh, are under. Uh, the concept of national security. As uh, we can see from uh, many articles in the law, like Article 9, Article 10 of the national security law can see that uh, many aspects of our everyday life are uh, also under the concept. So uh, I would say that um, even if there has to be new legislation, my understanding is that it has to be uh, 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 within the uh, uh, jurisdiction set up by the National People's Congress resolution, uh, but also that resolution can be all rounded and all inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, change? Anything to add on that? Or... Right. Oh, well, or other questions you you may pick let, up. Let from me the... say something about this. Yeah. Right? Okay. Sure. Well, I, I always emphasize uh, the principle of subsidiarity. That is, uh, whatever Hong Kong can do, the central government should not step in, should not interfere with. So if there's any other legislation, that legislation must respect, respect Hong Kong's jurisdiction, Hong Kong's uh, uh, autonomy. And, uh, you know, unless, unless there's something that Hong Kong cannot deal with, uh, like a pandemic, you know, if there is any, any kind of uh, thing like this that uh, Hong Kong is not able to deal with, then the central government will probably step in and help. Uh, and in terms of big, greater, you know, disorder and so on. Uh, otherwise, uh, it is my view that the central government should stay away from interfering any kind of uh, business of Hong Kong. Uh, let Hong Kong people do whatever they want to do. And that is, you know, consistent to uh, the principle of subsidiarity. So any legislation 
uh, that will forthcome uh, should be uh, restricted to that kind of uh, need. Otherwise, uh, it will be a kind of <laughs> interfere with, uh, interference. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so Albert, there's a question to you and to, to other public Chengji uh, also be able to offer some uh, answer. It's, so there are, uh, it's from Sharon, uh, Sharon. Um, the, there are different interpretations of national security law. There's, so there's a Chinese law interpretation. There's a Hong Kong law interpretation. That there's also the international interpretation according to say ICCPR by the UN bodies, uh, groups, committees. So uh, what's the weight uh, of you would give to the international interpretation? So, so if the Human Rights Committee uh, gives interpretation, right? if you recall the open letter by those uh, leading experts, their interpretation of the national security law. So, so if you compare you know, the, the weight uh, of different versions of interpretation, so how much weight do you, you would give to the international uh, interpretation? Um, as I just said, um, it is primarily the, uh, the the task of the Hong Kong courts to to interpret the national security law as as they apply it, but interpretation uh, by the court only takes place when a case reaches the court. Then, before the case reaches the court, uh, the police, uh, this new national security uh, unit uh, in the police will be investigating cases and then they will they decide you know, whether to initiate investigation on a case and then if they have uh, investigated a case and collected evidence then it uh, then they send the case to the department of justice uh, which also has a new unit on national security so so these people are actually in a sense also interpreting the national security law because they are interpreting the law for the purpose of deciding whether to initiate uh, in, in uh, investigation in a case, uh, they interpret the law for the purpose of deciding whether to prosecute uh, in a particular case, and then the case goes to court. So I I, I think that, that as far as the court's interpretation is concerned, it will be um, as as the court of first instance already said uh, in the Tong Yin Kit case, the court's interpretation will be based on uh, the common law approach of interpretation. So they say, the courts say that they are not going to, to adopt any mainland Chinese legal concepts or legal principles in interpreting the national security law. The court will use the common law approach to interpreting the national security law. The court also uses the international uh, human rights standards, which it has used in the past in, in interpreting other Hong Kong laws. And these international human rights standards, as Sing Chung has uh, have said, are actually uh, reaffirmed uh, in uh, the national security law itself. So the court can say that, well, the national security law reaffirms the application of the ICCPR and various uh, human rights and rule of law standards. So of course, we'll apply these standards in interpreting the national security law. So in the absence of an NPCSC interpretation of a national security law, I think the courts will still try their best to interpret the law in accordance with common law and, uh, and international human rights standards. But, the, but what is less, less uh, difficult to predict is how will the police and how will the Department of Justice interpret the law? Because if they interpret the law um, in a way, in a broad way, so that it will cover many cases, then they will bring many cases before the courts. If they interpret the law in a, in a liberal way, I mean, in a way uh, which narrows down the, the scope of the offenses, then very few cases will be brought before the court. So how the police and how the Department of Justice interpret the national security law may even be more uh, important in practice. Uh, of course, if, if many cases are brought before the court, then the court will have a very um, heavy responsibility in deciding how to interpret the law uh, as, as they decide these cases. 
I think Albert raised a very important issue on that as uh, you know, sometimes probably uh, we, we often say, oh, let's wait until the court has a decision, but then probably the court will never have a decision on some of the issues, right? Now the police have decided uh, something is likely to be subversive, right? So you cannot spoke them. You cannot uh, uh, post certain uh, slogans, a statement, right? So, so in that sense, the, the process is punishment, right? So, so the going through the police investigation is a sufficient de deterrent uh, 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 force already. You don't need the judges in the future, right? It, a simple police investigation detention without bail or is, is sufficient. So that probably is, uh, I think I agree with Albert, is a larger risk. Of course, at the end of the day, we we'll have to say, defer to the judicial opinions as to what's the proper boundary. That will probably take years to, to, to draw the boundary. So for now is, you no, know, don't have a first case in court uh, yet. Um, any comments from uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, thank you for the questions. I, I've um, noticed of the questions uh, from um, the uh, audience, and I agree with Professor Chen that um, the judiciary will have power to um, interpret the law, um, even though I think we also need to notice of Article 65 of the law, which says that the power of interpretation belongs to the NPCSC, which is identical with um, clause one of article 158. So that, that's why I said earlier that the um, uh, central government has intended to kind of, um, to, to control the power of the judiciary. It's, it does not encourage or it even discourage the court to behave more active. But as, as we um, we all share among the legal community, uh, courts can be active or inactive. It, it's um, what a common law courts, even Chinese courts, court judges um, can be active or um, less active or even more deferential. So, so it's up to the, the courts to to um, make the choice. Um, and I've, uh, I, I noticed that there's a question of, um, of from, from, from Sharon Holm that about, um, Professor Sharon Holm about the international um, covenants of human rights um, uh, application in Hong Kong or, or the potential implication of it. Uh, again, number one, uh, court judges have the discretion of power to interpret. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can see that uh, there's a um, kind of movement to internationalization um, from the, the courts. It's like the, the court's interpretation of the international human rights law have referred to um, cases and documents from other jurisdictions. So one of the particular case is the 1998 uh, national flag case, right? The Wu Wu Gong Shao and Li Jian Ren. So th that that case, uh, in that case, the, the courts referred to multiple jurisdictions cases, and also they examined whether or not uh, the law. Again, it's a national law in Appendix Three or um, um, Annex Three. So that so the courts have to. Uh, examine whether um, uh, the, 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 the deformation of the national flag and the regional flag um, is an infringement of the law or is it a freedom of expression protected or entrenched by international covenant of human rights. Um, in that particular case, the court said, no, it doesn't. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not uh, entrenched by international covenants of human rights. But in some other cases, the courts, um, as the court said, they, they can read in or read down. So the, the courts have the, 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 
power to, to provide um, statutory interpretation. Um, another question is about Article 62. I think, again, this is an interesting provision which says that if um, Hong Kong's uh, local ordinances are inconsistent with this law, then this law should prevail. I think this is very much like uh, Article 2 of Human Rights um, Ordinance uh, of 1990. Um, but again, you, you have to interpret it, right? Uh, for example, it only says that um, Hong Kong the local law cannot um, contradict with this law, but it doesn't say, you know, this law will prevail the basic law. <laughs> so judges can always argue or, or or um, make the argument by, by, by legal counsels that, um, you know, because this, this is just a part of the basic law or this is a separate law. So this law should be consistent with the basic law. Uh, so a particular law may look like it's inconsistent with this law, but it might still be consistent with the higher law, the basic law, right? So um, I, I think, Judges, again, I think Hong Kong judges will have to really uh, creative. Um, and, and that's why we, we you know, I, I think we, we still need to trust the judiciary without giving them too much pressures because it, it looks like they will have to take all the burdens, but at the same time, um, I think they, they will be able to read from the law that um, the central government has a clear message there. Yeah. Uh, so just want to echo what uh, I think uh, Xin Zhong, uh, uh, Jian, and Albert said earlier is so that we all have to show our gratitude and respect to the judiciary. Uh, what is happening out there uh, in this propaganda war is not really healthy. Uh, I hope uh, oh, I, I'm not surprised if, uh, if in, in, in the near future the DOG has to sort of uh, start to think about content of court proceedings. If some of the, uh, I, I don't think it, it, the, the criticism that's very much insults to the judiciary continues. Um, right, let's move on. Um, there is a, a question on Article 60, uh, Article 50 uh, of the National Security Law. It's basically it's the, the office of the, uh, the National Security Office. Uh, they, they need to comply with Hong Kong law, but then they are immune from Hong Kong law in, their, uh, in, in carrying out their duties. So and the question is how to read those two uh, apparently contradictory uh, articles. Um, um, maybe, maybe I'll say a few words. Yeah, uh, actually, sure. uh, a mainland scholar, uh, Huang Ming Tao, has actually studied this this issue, and I I, I was at another Yi conference uh, in, in which Professor Huang presented a paper, and I agree with his approach, which is to to use as a reference points the um, the garrison law uh, governing the the Chinese military in Hong Kong. Uh, the garrison law is much more detailed than the uh, national security law in um, in uh, uh, providing for the the scope or, or the extent to which the Chinese troops uh, in Hong Kong are subject to Hong Kong law and the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong courts. And I think some of the principles in the garrison law uh, can also be applied uh, in dealing with the uh, the legal status and liability of the uh, Office uh, of uh, National Security uh, established by the Central Government in Hong Kong. So basically, even though um, this office uh, is not um, uh, is, is immune from the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong courts and the Hong Kong law enforcement authorities, uh, there, uh, there, there are limits uh, to this immunity. So if you read the exact uh, wording uh, of the uh, of the uh, provision, which is I think in Article, um, is it sixty? Sixty, yeah, fifteen, sixty. Yeah, yeah. 
Ah, there goes 60. Um, uh, says that uh, the the office uh, and its personnel is not subject to the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong SAL uh, with regard to acts uh, committed in pursuance of their duty. So I'm I'm reading from a Chinese text uh, and doing my own translation. Uh, so this is similar. There's, there's a similar provision in the garrison law, basically saying that the members of the garrison in Hong Kong, uh, uh, in performing acts uh, in pursuance of the duties, will not be subject to the jurisdiction of Hong Kong courts. But in relation to acts, uh, other acts, you know, not uh, in execution of the duty, they are subject to Hong Kong law and the, the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong court. So, so if somebody, a member of the garrison uh, goes to a supermarket and steals something, uh, this person will be subject to uh, being arrested by the Hong Kong police and being prosecuted uh, by the Hong Kong court. So I think this principle also applies to members of the uh, Office of National Security established by by Beijing in Hong Kong, as it also applies to people in the liaison office uh, of the Central People's Government in Hong Kong. Uh, if you look at the garrison law, you can also see more detailed provisions. For example, it, it provides that the Supreme People's Court has jurisdiction over certain civil cases uh, involving members of the garrison. Uh, and uh, Hong Kong courts have jurisdiction over other types of cases. So, so my own view is that um, Article 50, uh, sorry, Article 60 um, only confers a limited immunity uh, on the um, on the personnel of the Office of National Security, uh, and that is in relation to acts committed in in the course of their duty. So, and Hong Kong courts also have. A say, you know, in a particular case, Hong Kong courts also have a say as to whether this particular act uh, is is committed uh, in the course of execution of duty. So, for those acts which are committed in the course of execution of duty, Hong Kong courts don't have jurisdiction. So, but but the, but it is said that um, they are subject to the, the mainland uh, supervisory uh, organs. So, the mainland supervisory organs led by the national. Supervision Commission uh, established uh, in 2018 uh, will will have jurisdiction over over say um, uh, alleged uh, crimes committed by office by members of this office, and they can also uh, you know arrange for pro the prosecution of members of this office uh, before a mainland court. Yeah, I think probably a larger. Uh, a, a, a slightly different issue is uh, if the office start to exercise some of their power, such as gathering intelligence, uh, whether they could have the investigative powers. I think so. The law is silent on that issue, so I'm not quite sure whether there will be other implementation rules. Uh, which may authorize or limit the power of investigation. Uh, that, of course, out, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that outside of the Article 55, right? The, 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 the general uh, investigative power uh, outside of the uh, scope of uh, Article 50, 55. But anyway, so any other questions so, you may have spotted you want to have answered? Yes. Yeah. Shoji? Yeah. Can I respond to what you Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, in principle, agree with what Professor Chen just said uh, completely. I, I think the Chinese troops, the immunities enjoyed by the Chinese troops here are uh, very uh, similar, I think, to the immunities enjoyed by the new uh, uh, Office of Safeguarding National Security in Hong Kong. However, I think there's uh, one difference, is that uh, the Chinese troops, when they are in duty, they uh, usually they are required to be in uniform. So their actions are almost open and public when they exercise uh, duties. So it's uh, comparatively relatively easier to determine whether a Chinese soldier or officer is in duty. Uh, but uh, the, the Office of Safeguarding National Security uh, 
according to its uh, roles and duties, its operations might not be that in open or in public. So uh, my understanding of the Article 60 is, um, I think it's uh, a bit more broader and uh, in practice might be more broader uh, than the, um, the, the, the law governing the Chinese troops in Hong Kong. Uh, so uh, the, in the course of duty itself, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, something up for uh, interpretation because uh, the office, the operation of the office uh, are very likely uh, to, to be in secrecy, not in public or in open way. Uh, the other thing is that uh, for supervisory bodies, I think it's under the National Supervisory Committee, but uh, according to political norms of the Chinese Communist Party, I, I, I think there will also be uh, sort of, uh, uh, there, there will also be a disciplinary, disciplinary organ sent by the Central Supervisory Committee stationed within the, uh, that agency. That, that, that's the common practice of uh, Chinese uh, car carbonate level uh, agencies. But I, I don't know whether that applies to, to this one or, no, uh, or not. But I think that's the common practice of uh, the party state. Yeah. Yeah. Dong, any questions you're interested in uh, picking up? And uh, no, I think, yeah. Any other? Mm -hmm. So the there's a question is uh, I think uh, from the economist. Uh, the question is in relation to Jimmy Nye's case. I don't know anyone knows anything about that case. Is being arrested but not charged. So what is likely the the outcome of that case depends on geopolitics, depends on rule of law, facts. Any comments? I'm not. Uh, well. I think since the police has already established this unit uh, for national security cases, so I suppose since a unit has been established and there are staff, so they, they have to to perform the duty. So I think if the dean establishes a new new unit in the faculty and appoints uh, several people, including me, to be in that unit, then I have to do something, is that right? I, don't I cannot know. do. Uh, <laughs> I cannot say, say that. Well, there are no cases. I don't do do anything. Mm. So, so it's. Uh, I think it's the internal logic of the unit that once it is established, it has to, to work. It has to be in operation. Mm. So, so mm. I think it will, you know, continue mm. to investigate the case, and if there's any evidence which, it believes um, may constitute an offense, uh, it would, you know, refer to the Department of Justice. So maybe this 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 logic will be you know mm. will be set into operation. There's little which people can do about it. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Right. Any anything? Um, I I. I didn't know enough about Jimmy Lai's case, um, but I, I doubt it's for um, geopolitical concerns because um, first of all, if uh, there's real, uh, you know, if, if his uh, action or his activities have really um, caused a certain uh, frustration or anxiety, then um, I, I don't think he, he could be uh, able to avoid being snatched. <laughs> he, 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 I don't think he, he will be an exceptional case for that kind of um, um, reaction from Beijing. And on the other hand, if um, he activities um, satisfy other laws in Hong Kong. So there seems to be no need uh, to utilize the national security law because the law is controversial itself. Uh, and I also think there's another probably um, perspective of it is that um, in the end of the day, I think um, Beijing is worried about foreign influences. Right? So um, 
I wonder if Jimmy Lai himself may be a, a foreign national, or maybe you know he he is he's considered one of the founder of some of the uh, social movements or uh, revolt um, activities. But uh, if he is the founder himself, um, at least as a lawyer. Um, you, you cannot simply say that he received the foreign funding, right? Because he, 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 he may have a foreign identity himself. I, I think the, the complexity applies to other Hong Kong residents. If people have other um, identities, how, how could you retrieve uh, the source of funding? <laughs> Should those consider as foreign um, funding from uh, foreign organizations or they are foreign by nature because um, these people are foreigners. So I, I think we'll, we'll have to see how, again, the courts interpret the law and uh, if the NPCSC has its own um, interpretations. Right. So I think, uh, thank you very much. I think that it's almost uh, time to wrap things up. So in the remaining probably uh, a few minutes, uh, can I invite the speakers to make a very quick and brief, uh, concise concluding statement as to where we are going? Uh, what is the, the principles uh, you think that is the most important one for, for Hong Kong to follow? May I start with uh, Xiao Jun, let's reverse the order. Um, the final word from you. Okay, thank you, Professor Fu. I, uh, I and also the panelists and Professor Chen for the comments. Uh, I think this morning we had a fascinating discussion and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, my conclusion, my concluding remarks uh, might be this, that I think Hong Kong's future should be decided by the Hong Kong people here. And uh, it's actually being decided by the Hong Kong people here. So uh, what the, uh, the mutual trust between Hong Kong and Beijing and uh, the uh, sort of uh, interactive uh, relationship between the two parties, uh, Beijing and Hong Kong, in the future course of the one country, two systems will uh, de determine uh, what our shared future will look like. So we need to uh, be um, uh, careful and wise, and wise in terms of uh, dealing with such a very uh, complex and complicated relationship. Thank you. Uh, Xin Zhong. Okay, uh, I'm still, uh, you know, clinging to my idea of constitutional commitments. Uh, I think this, uh, uh, you know, we are in a very difficult situation here, but. Uh, Obviously, you know, respect for the central authorities, that's, that's something needed. On the other hand, uh, subsidiarity principle should also be practiced. So uh, as long as we keep our faith in a one country, two systems ideal, and I think people will find out the way out of the, this difficult uh, situation, difficult dilemma here. I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I hope that Hong Kong will uh, become uh, better and better. Thank, Thank you. you for your optimism. Uh, uh, Jie? Um, Thank you again for organizing this uh, round table. I learned a lot from other panelists and the uh, uh, questions from the audience. And I think the controversy of this law invites us to um, to rethink and reflect on the nature of um, one country, two systems, as well as the relationship between Hong Kong and, and China, and also how, um, as a collective community, either as Hong Kong people or as Chinese people, or you know, wherever we are, how are we able to form a consensus under contemporary, in the contemporary world? Um, what are the, the better and more institutional and more uh, acceptable way to 
uh, form such um, consensus um, without sacrificing um, too much of our ordinary life. Thank you. Albert, anything to say? Uh, Xiao Jin just mentioned that the future of Hong Kong depends on the uh, people of Hong Kong. And it, there's a process of interaction between Hong Kong and mainland. I think in this process of interaction, the politicians of Hong Kong play a very important role. So if, if the so-called opposition side continues uh, to adopt a very uh, confrontational and non-cooperative approach with the mainland, uh, I think uh, the future of Hong Kong is, is actually quite um, worrying. Uh, for example, this NPC has decided to extend the term of office of the current LESCO, but, but many members in the so pro-democracy camp uh, are still considering whether to join, whether to continue in office. And it seems that there is a reasonable chance that they would, they would decline to continue to participate. This doesn't, I think this would be a negative development if the relationship between the so-called uh, pro-establishment camp and, and the pro-democracy pro camp continues to, to, to be as, as poor as it has been in the last year. Uh, if the pro-democracy continues to engage in so-called non-cooperation with the government, uh, I don't see any any way out of this current uh, you know, political crisis uh, or, or, or the problem of governance uh, in Hong Kong. So, so a change of mind on their part uh, would be needed. And of the people of Hong Kong in, in voting and deciding whom to vote for may also have a say. So. So ultimately, as Zhao Jun said, it depends on the people of Hong Kong, but the people of Hong Kong cannot act directly. They have to act through uh, the politicians uh, who are supposed to represent them. Right, so, so I hope, uh, I, I will say that to, to all political leaders, the pandemic crisis are otherwise, uh, I think we need to de-escalate a little bit. We have one year time to deliberate, discuss, reach a consensus. Uh, if we cannot do that within a year, I think we will have to repeat some of the crises and the difficulties we faced in the past. At the end of the day, right, we, may, we are not enemies of each other. Uh, we may disagree and even disagree fundamentally on some of the significant issues, but then I think, I think we, we share this community in Hong Kong. Uh, everybody says we love Hong Kong. I haven't heard anyone say I don't love Hong Kong. Uh, if th that been the case, so when we all came together to show you, to demonstrate your, your love to the community. But I want to thank all the audience. Uh, for Many of you may have attended many of our seminars. I hope you will come back, uh, uh, participating in the discussion and uh, is a, a sign of resilience, right? It's a, it's a way to express ourselves, to show our confidence, to show our resolve, resolve that that crisis can be conquered and uh, we could reach a, a solution that uh, most of us will be happy with. So on that note, I want to thank you for, for your participation. And uh, finally, of course, uh, thank you all the panelists for spending your time. And uh, I uh, hope we could continue the conversation uh, in the uh, future. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.